allora diamo il benvenuto alla nostra carissima Connie Guzzo McParland, dico carissima perché Connie Guzzo e io siamo anche amiche, ci tengo, ci tengo a dirlo, and I switch into English because this is a seminar in English today. Um, I already presented Connie Guzzo to the students, so I don't think I, I have to make it short now, I mean no necessity because we've spoken already on Wednesday, on last Wednesday about you. Um, Connie Guzzo is president of Guernica, which is a very important publisher house in, based in Canada, but very important for the field of Italian American studies in general, as I think she will explain yeah. later. Later, Connie is also a writer and she will be talking today about her last novel, was about to be translated in, the, in Italian with Rubertino, editore, and also a little bit about Italian Canadian literature. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professoressa Ganeri, and uh, thank you all for being present. Uh, un caro saluto da una zona rossa all'altra. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present my work at the University of Calabria. Um, as you know, my first novel, The Girls of Piazza d'Amore, uh, is fully set in a fictional um, small town in Calabria named Mulirena. Uh, and I do confess that uh, Mulirena is modeled after my own birthplace of Miglierina in the province of Catanzaro. Uh, so I come not far from there. Uh, the second novel, The Woman of Saturn, is set in Montreal, uh, though Mulirena still exerts uh, a strong presence in the life of the characters. So, as uh, Marita mentioned, I'm happy to announce that the two novels will be merged into one and uh, published in Italian by Rubettino Editore, hopefully in the spring of 2022. So, though at times I speak of the novels separately, uh, you may consider them as one because it deals with the same characters. Uh, so, the presentation has two parts. Um, I'll first give you the broad outlines uh, and themes of the novels, uh, but focusing mostly on the narrator's growth as a writer because narrator wants to be a writer. Then for the second part, I'd like to bring out various issues around Italian-Canadian literature and immigrant writing, uh, some of which are brought up in the novel. So I am wearing two hats, uh, that of writer and that of publisher, uh, and now also that of translator, since I, I did uh, self-translate most of my work. And uh, so I'll be happy to answer questions later on uh, on any of these topics. Um, I also realized that this co uh, course focuses on Italian-American culture uh, and language uh, and that we Canadians are sometimes considered uh, poor cousins to the Americans, um, but we see, but I think, you know, we regard the American uh, in general here. Um, and I've also gotten to know many Italian-American writers uh, and I've learned that we all face the same uh, issues and challenges. I came into writing creatively later on in life uh, when I decided to um, go back to my studies and entered um, Concordia University and studied creative writing. And um, as, my, as a creative thesis, I wrote a novel, um, which um, at times I, I, I titled the novel, the novel Girotondo. Uh, and this is the, the reason why, and this is the way I explained this title to my professors. Girotondo is the Italian name of the children's game Ring Around the Rosy. The word giro has connotations in Italian that this novel develops as symbolism. Giro may be translated as a turn, a tour, or a circle. Far un giro is to take a short ride with the aim of returning to the starting point. While gira and rigira is to go around in circles. Mettere in giro, to spread rumors, while una presa in giro is to be taken for a ride or be fooled. So with these uh, nuances in mind, uh, the novel presents a group of people whose traditional lives have been disrupted by the process of immigration and who live a somewhat disjointed existence. Um, so the uh, symbol of the circle and the circularity, circularity is very important. In this. Um, so my first motivation, my motivation when I started to write, uh, like that of the protagonist, Katerina or Kathy, uh, was to preserve on paper some of the images that I brought with me as a child, mainly images of carefree existence surrounded by loving family and many friends, and my personal memories were happy ones. 
And as the, as the young Katarina remembers, uh, quote, on summer evenings, the woman congregated on one of the doorsteps, reciting the rosary, gossiping and telling stories, while the kids counted stars and chased fireflies. So it was the sense of community lost by immigrating that the young narrator longs for, sometimes with pain. And she says, though these memories have become less frequent over time, they come accompanied by small pangs of discomfort, a tightening of the chest. I remember reading that for some, having had a happy childhood is almost as painful as having suffered an unhappy one. It feels like the persistent ache of yearning, like the grief for a lost love. So, however, even at her young age, uh, Katerina observes that the town is at times divided into two, especially around election times, when all conflicts between families uh, rise up, and gossip is constant and at times malicious. As the story develops, she looks back through the lens of an adult woman raised in Canada, and she cannot be oblivious to the condition of women in the male-dominated society of the town and how the women were conditioned from a very early age to defer to their fathers and brothers and be subservient to them. Though evocative, the story of the first novel does not wallow in nostalgia or shy away from demonstrating the other face of living in a small community that was split by politics, old family feuds, and patriarchal culture. So the promise uh, of this first part um, forms the backstory to the second. And in summary, I'll just summarize it. Uh, Caterina accompanies uh, three older girls in their evening passeggiate and carries their love notes to the boys that they love. Because of family conflicts that go back to the fascist years, one of the girls, Lucia, is forced by her brother to leave her childhood sweetheart to marry someone by proxy that she had never met and emigrate to Canada. And this is something that happened very often during that period. Katarina observes and witnesses all the complications of the story until she and her family also live in Lorena for Montreal, and Lucia travels on the same boat with them. Katarina's mother takes on the responsibility of keeping an eye on, on Lucia, and the book ends as they board the train for Naples on their way to Halifax. Now, in the prologue of the second novel, and I should show you at least the, the covers, and I don't know if you see it well, but this is the first, uh, this is the second novel, The Women of Saturn. And the first, The Girls of Piazza d'Amore, with a picture which is a picture of a, a fountain not far from me, near my town. So it uh, has a very calabrese feel. So in the prologue of The Women of Saturn, the author says In my childhood imagination, life, my own, and those of friends and people around me, was to be lived like the black and white images of the post-war Italian films that the village parish priest projected onto an open air screen on religious holidays. That perspective would soon be altered by momentous, the woozy trip across the Atlant Atlantic that promised new vista and experiences. So um, the stories of the three girls that Katerina had observed uh, so closely became stories in her imagination even before she decided to write about them. Um, and as she prepares to board the ship, the Saturnia, she says, I had planned to keep a diary of the sea voyage so that I could write about it to my friends back home. No one else I knew had done this before. It was as if people left for another world and once they were there, the passage itself was forgotten like a bad dream. And so she keeps a sort of journal while she's on the, uh, the ship. Now, the passage, however, turns out to be quite traumatic for the young girl. Uh, besides the bad weather and the seasickness, Katerina is relegated by her mother, who is sick in bed, to stay next to Lucia at all times, um, especially because one of the stewards of the, of the boats pays special attention to her. Lucia plays along with these advances, flirts with him, even though she's officially married. Uh, and so because of these actions, uh, Katarina's world turns upside down during the voyage. Her teacher had given her the novel I Promessi Sposi as a gift, and Katarina spends most of the time immersed in the book and can't help but compare her friend's behavior of her marriage, uh, uh, I'm sorry, her friend's betrayal of her marriage vows with that of Manzoni's Chase Lucia. 
After an incident in which she finds Lucia in a cabin with another man, she's very troubled and confused. She says, the other Lucia would never have done something like this. I can't wait for this trip to be over and walk on solid ground again. Uh, and in the evening, she relieves the happy memories that she had left behind and keeps notes uh, for fear of losing them forever. So the crossing becomes uh, a transition from the old world to the new. Uh, and for Caterina, also a certain loss of innocence. It forms and defines her. It will always be the reference point between what she was and what she becomes. Now, in the third part, so the you can uh, basically uh, see the novel as three parts, so the preparation of the voyage, the voyage, and then life in Montreal. So 25 years later, we find Caterina, who now is called Kathy, teaching in a large high school in an ethnic area of Montreal. One of her students is Lucia's daughter, Angelina or Angie, who is almost the same age as her mother when, she, when Lucia traveled together with Caddy. And you will also notice that almost every character in this uh, book has two names. Uh, in the first chapter, we learn that Lucia has been found beaten into a coma, presumably by her husband who has disappeared. Uh, while Lucia is at the hospital, Kathy decides to take Angie into her home. Angie is a troubled girl and a problem student. In dealing with her and trying to understand what has happened to Lucia, Kathy relives the village stories, the ocean crossing, and also the first difficult and painful years of, that, of adaptations in Montreal. And asks herself, where were the seeds of this tragedy sowed early on without any of us realizing it? So the events of the story in this part of the book become quite complicated. Um, there are insinuations of Lucia's family being connected to the Montreal Mafia with ties to corruptions in the construction industry. Uh, there are problems at school, uh, mostly caused by Angie. And Kathy's relationship with her Canadian living boyfriend becomes strained because he's involved in politics and doesn't want to be connected to Lucia's family through Kathy. So all this is told in the backdrop of school and Quebec politics of the period. But I will leave all these uh, details behind. I'll let you read them hopefully in the, in the spring in Italian, or the book can also be ordered in English anytime. So, um, so far I've given you the larger outline of the story. Um, it spans many periods, the 50s, 60s and 80s, uh, and it presents all the phases of the immigrant experience. And within it are contained many layers, themes, and sub-themes. But I'll, uh, next, what I'll mention is two of the most important themes that are particular to my novel. One is, uh, I go back to my mother's old proverb in Calabrese, tutto mundo e paese. And uh, this is uh, exemplified by the three main settings. And I actually have a photo here just for the, for the sake of illustration, I don't know whether you see it, of uh, three settings. We have here the village, a village, uh, a ship, and a school. And I superimpose them uh, because um, I wanted to show that um, the ship and the school are but uh, microcosm of the village that we had left behind and the village that we always carry with us. Um, the same jealousies, rivalries that existed in the village also exist um, thousands of miles away from the original uh, place of birth. So without spoiling the suspense that is created, uh, at the end of the novel, we find that harm, evil can come not from the outside, but from, but from within our own families, our own school and our own village. Also in focusing on the three women characters, I wanted to demonstrate how the process of emigra immigration or immigration affects the generations differently so that Lucia remains the traditional older Italian woman. Uh, she remains in a coma and silent throughout the novel, uh, though we learned that she had lived a secret life by necessity. Her daughter Angie is the younger generation that rebels openly against the old traditions, while Kathy, the narrator, straddles, straddles both worlds and is neither here nor there and, and struggles to find her true identity. And this is the position that many of us find our, found ourselves in. So um, for the purpose of this talk, then I'll focus on Kathy's compulsion to connect what is happening in Montreal in the present uh, to what happened in Mulidena, and then her ambitious decision to put it all into a novel and write about it. But her insecurity about identity 
is also mirrored in her lack of confidence in her writing. Uh, she first becomes anxious about her ability as a writer when a young male paisano from Mulirena comes to Montreal as a tourist in the 19, for the 1967 World Fair in Montreal that we call Expo 67. He has studied in Rome and has become a journalist. His identity remains somewhat vague uh, and she only refers to him as the journalist. Um, she throws him around the city and becomes infatuated with him. And she wants to impress him and tells him that as a hobby, she likes writing about the past. And he says, um, Mulirena, four houses and four cats, what's there to write about? And she responds, I want to preserve my memories. And he answers, the only thing worth preserving is jardiniera. And even then, if kept too long, it becomes soft and rancid. Now, she's completely disappointed and mortified by his reaction, but still has enough nerve to ask him for feedback on a story about the voyage. Now, not only does he not give her any feedback, uh, but he never calls her back. And then he soon marries a French Quebec woman, most likely so, she can, uh, so he can remain in Canada. Kathy feels crushed and humiliated. She writes a prose poem about the day she has spent with him and then stops writing altogether. Meanwhile, the journalist becomes the editor of a community literary journal with the pen name of Antoine. In one of the articles, he writes, the immigrant experience story has been done ad nauseum. It's time we transcend the voyage and move on to other themes. The segment really upsets Kathy, and she wonders, uh, have I waited too long to write my story? On an impulse, she finds the courage to write a letter to the editor, but under a pseudonym, and she calls her, herself Rina, short for Katarina, obviously. And she says, um, dear Antoine, uh, what are we supposed to do? Hide our writing just because others have written about the same topic before us? And why does everything we write have to be labeled immigrant writing? I've lived in this country three times longer than in Italy. I don't feel like an immigrant anymore. And he responds, dear Rina, it's because we live in multicultural heaven. If your name is Italian and your writing has a departure, a voyage and a landing, it's going to be labeled an immigrant story, whether you like it or not. The industry, especially academia, thrives on classification. They classify us in order to keep us in our places. And then he goes on and on about denigrating the concept of multiculturalism in Canada, which may sound uh, odd to you, um, but I'll explain that part later. So that answer flusters Kathy, and she says uh, to herself, how can I possibly write about Lucia and my own experiences without focusing on our departure, our voyage, and our landing? At another time, after he denigrates some local Italian-Canadian writers, she writes, Dear Antoine, what do you ridicule the efforts made by young ethnic writers to write about their past? And he responds, Dear Rina, uh, first, let us put the ethnic label to rest. It smells of ethnic cleansing to me. The compulsion to write is typical and normal for the children of immigrants who have come of age to either record their experiences for posterity, <clears throat> to purge themselves of guilt, or to pay tribute to aging parents. But they often do so under the glow of nostalgia because they don't really remember. They can only imagine the idyllic pastoral life of their nonas. Well, reading about nostalgia gives me gas pains because I remember a time back home when people tore at each other's throat for a bucket of water and some sold their souls for a visa to America and so on and so forth. And then it says, confessional memo memoirs of the first generation may, may be of therapeutic value to the writer, but they contribute nothing to the community's body of literary works. So she, Kat is totally intimidated by all these comments. Uh, and she thinks that, you know, he raises the bar so high for first time writers like me. I only want to tell my story and that of the people that I know uh, that may be similar to others uh, without having to worry about all these academic uh, ramblings. Uh, um, so there are other sim similar interactions um, to, on other topics, uh, uh, but the more she thinks about the standards set by the journalists, the more confused she becomes. And uh, after the last article in which he belittles Canadian literature now, because it claims it has no tradition compared to Italian literature, she writes, uh, 
Dear Antoine, doesn't tradition need time to flourish? It's like blaming a young man for his youth. Uh, why not give local writers credit and encouragement for what they have achieved so far and acknowledge that we're also influenced by our Canadian experience and, and literature? And he writes, uh, Dear Rena, uh, forget about copying the Canadian literary model. They may have perfected the short story, but can't look beyond their kitchen windows. Canadian literature is only about burnt toast. We have a richer European literary tradition to back us up. Foscoli, Leopardi, Pirandello, and the contemporaries, Stevo, Calvino. Look them up and study them before writing your next line. So, you know, she, you know, she feels crushed. And with her hidden identity, though, it was easy for her to, you know, to have some audacity and then to her frustration. So she responds, Dear Antoine, get off your Italian marble pedestal for once. You're an intellectual snob. And to her surprise, he answers, my ultimate aim is to raise the quality of writing to reflect our tradition without falling into the traps imposed on us by the establishment and their containment strategy, which is multiculturalism. How many books can our basements hold? We get grants for publishing minoritarian literature, but then no one reviews or buys our books. Our differences of opinion are not only philosophical, but strategic as well. At this point, she gives up and stops the correspondence. Uh, and she says to herself, uh, realize that his rants sounded like a broken record and his responses were almost always politically motivated. So in 1980, through a chain of events, um, she decides to confront him after he writes about the details surrounding Lucia's beating because he also knows Lucia because he comes from Molirena and the family's connection to the mafia. It angers Kathy because she fears that some of the revelation will hurt Angie, who is in her care. So she visits him, and after some conversation, uh, she tells him again that she's still writing, and now she's writing a novel, uh, because she wants to vindicate their, their past. And she says, I want to write something that is worth telling, something that pays due respect to places and people. I want to find a fitting ending. <clears throat> and he tries to discourage her again, and he says, uh, What's a fitting ending? You're worried about the ending when you can't even get started? I don't think you realize the absurdity of tying it all together in this day and age. Then he, after he writes another article that reveals some more personal information about Lucia, Angie, the, the young girl, runs away from home. Uh, uh, Kathy looks all over her. Uh, and then she storms into, into the journalist's office and blames him and accuses him of playing politics and exploiting the friend's story for his own interests and accuses him of being an opportunist. And she tells him, you took to bed with a fever, just like a Donna Bondi, she screams at him. And he responds, please calm down. You're an intelligent girl, but you have completely lost your mind. Don't bring Manzon into this discussion. Get me out of your head once and for all. This is 1980. Let's not pretend we can do the impossible, fix things that we have shattered beyond any hope of repair. And then they have a final big argument. She calls him a phony, a pompous, a stuffy, an unretentive fart, a coward, and a fraud. He calls her an amateur writer, which obviously really you know, gets her upset. So she leaves. And he says, goodbye, Rina. And then she answers, yes, goodbye, Rina, and runs out. She comes to the realization that she has to tell her story her own way by herself without any help. So the novel only gets written uh, later in 2019 when Kathy returns to Italy and to Mulirena with the hope that going back to the source will help her find the perfect ending. In the epilogue, as she leaves Italy to go back to Montreal, she writes, have I come full circle? If I have, it is not how I had envisioned the outcome. Maybe the closing of the circle is an unrealizable chimera for our days or maybe its importance has been highly overrated. Questions will always remain. Lucia remains lost to us, the sacrificial lamb of our nomadic adventure. The only act of defiance is to plug the void with written words. And uh, so this brings us uh, to the end of the novel. And uh, so I do have now a short presentation on Italian uh, Canadian writing. Um, so if you permit me, we'll go into the second part. Have a glass of water. Yes, of course. I hope I'm not tired of my voice. <laughs> so, 
So, um, before speaking of Italian Canadian writing, I think I should say a few words about Canadian national writing and publishing. Um, also, uh, I'd like to point out that the period between 1970 and 1980 of the of the second novel is very significant, both for the history of Canadian na national literature and the advent of Italian Canadian literature. Up to the late 60s and 70s, we studied mainly British literature in English schools and French in French schools. And American pop culture dominated television and the entertainment industry. We never so any, we never watched Canadian. Uh, uh, TV at that point. But Canada itself was coming to terms in finding its own identity as a country against the shadow of our neighbor in the South. A famous Canadian writer, Mordecai Richler, that you may know from Barney's version, in one of his first novels, which I consider one of his best, Solomon Gursky was here, defined Canada as not yet a country, but the next door place. So with Expo 67, uh, uh, which I also cover in the novel, Canada celebrates uh, the 100th anniversary of it becoming a nation. And the concept of a mosaic of different cultures as opposed to the American melting pot was taken hold. And in 1971, our then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, who, is, uh, who was the father of the present uh, Justin Trudeau, made multiculturalism the official policy of the Canadian government. And then the policy declared the government will support and encourage the various cultures and ethnic groups that give structure and, vit and vitality to our society. So in a way, Canada's image as a multicultural nation became part of its new identity. Now, we can't talk of, uh, whenever we talk of Canada, we also have to think of Quebec as a separate um, entity because of it being a French province. Uh, and uh, the province of Quebec in, in 75 had elected a separate provincial government. And they were opposed to this policy. They were afraid that uh, uh, it devalued the role of the French. They were afraid that they, the French speaking population would be considered part of the mosaic and not as founding nations. Um, so there was a lot of opposition to multiculturalism in the province. And now to stem uh, the American cultural invasion um, of the period, uh, under pressure from its artists, writers, uh, and book publishers, the government instituted the Canada Council for the Arts with the aim uh, of promoting financial support um, for Canadian content in books, films, theater, dance, music, and the visual arts, which still exist today. Since then, Canadian literature, or can lit, as we usually commonly call it, blossomed and has produced many great writers you know some of them, among them many newcomers from different cultures like Michael Vanji, Austin Clark, Nino Ricci and so on. Also with the help of grants from the CC, uh, many new publishing houses emerged during this period. Almost sim simultaneously to these events or because of them, a group of young poets and writers of Italian origin also made their voices heard. And you may have heard of the first anthology of Italian Canadian writers uh, titled Roman Candles, which was edited by Giorgio Di Chico, which was published in 1978. So the, this early wave of writers wrote in Italian, English, and French, and mainly about immigration or the effects of immigration and the generational conflicts between the old traditions of their parents and themselves. They also complained that in spite of talks about multiculturalism, their books were not being published by the mainstream publishers and felt marginalized. So they also decided to mobilize uh, their efforts. In 1978, uh, a gutsy poet, Antonio Alfonso, took matters into his hands and founded Guernica Editions, which I now run together with the director, Michael Mirella. Now, the mission was of publishing writers from the margins, more specifically Italian Canadian writers. And the press developed a reputation as an edgy press promoting diversity and pluriculturalism. So we can easily say that uh, Antonio Alfonso published almost every Italian Canadian author writing at that time, including uh, Penny Petrone, Mary Adizzi, Frank Pacci, Caterina Edwards, Mary Melfi, Gio Giovanna Patriarca, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, he also published many Italian American authors that you may have uh, read about. Maria Mazziotti Gillen is still one of our uh, best selling authors. Uh, Mary Bush, Richard Gambino, Robert Viscuti, Franklin Trichia, uh, Marisa Labozzetta, Michael Carini, 
Anthony Tamburi, Fred Gaddafi, published all of these authors, and they still were still publishing Italian American authors. Um, he also published most of the books of essays that started analyzing the works of Italian Canadian writers as well. Now, in 1984, um, the same uh, writers got together and founded the Association of Italian Canadian Writers. Now, the first group was very politically minded. Many were academics in universities and highly educated and took active part in the discussions around multiculturalism and the politics of the day. Many in Quebec, like the journalists, uh, were left-leaning and pro-separatist against multiculturalism. Um, this multiculturalism as a way to get to eyes the new arrivals with the pretext of throwing them some crumbs by encouraging, by only encouraging folkloric exhibits. Um, and a lot was written about that issue. Um, now, most of the books of essays uh, were written by Francesco Loriccio, Pasquale Verdicchio, uh, Filippo Salvatore, Joseph Pivato, and others uh, that you may have heard of, and also published by, all published by Wernicke editions. And at conference and meetings, uh, many discussions center on identity politics, especially on the definitions on what to call Italian Canadian writing. Was it minority writing? Was it ethnic writing? Immigrant writing? Should it have a hyphen between Italian and Canadian or not have a hyphen? Should we be called um, Canadian Italians rather than Italian Canadian? And so forth. It went on and on. Uh, Alfo Antonio Alfonso wrote a book in which he claimed that we should call itself, ourselves Italics, and that's it. Um, and also the, you know, the question, how long does one consider one's, oneself to be an immigrant? And should we, should we stop writing about immigration for fear of propagating our own stereotypes? Um, so it's in the context of this early period that the narrator reflects on the writing of the immigrant story. Um, now, personally, I was not part of this early wave of writers since, as I said, I only started writing in 2000. Uh, at the time, I also became a member of the AICW, which is the Association of Italian Canadian Writers, and started reading many of the essays written on the subject and attended many conferences and talks on Italian Canadian writing. Now, my first observation um, when reading some of the books published uh, was that there had been a disproportionate amount of poetry, biographical writing, and essays in relation to fiction and a lot of academic discussions. And one event that made me reflect on my writing was a presentation in 2000 when I attended my first conference uh, of the Italian Canadian writers uh, in Montreal. A professor Gilardino taught at McGill University in Italian Studies Department presented a paper, La Letteratura Italo Canadese, which he equated to La Letteratura de Migrazione. De migrazione. And like many Italians from Italy at the time, he was highly critical of the first generation of writers. He wrote, Non hanno mai saputo trasformare quei personaggi veri, quei fatti veri, in personaggi e avvenimenti più vero del vero, cioè in personaggi letterari e dunque universali. So I was grappling with all of these uh, different arguments uh, when I started writing my thesis and wonder where, where I fit where I fit in, or if I fit in at all. Uh, though I did agree that fiction was the way I wanted to go, uh, although there was there's much biographical content in the book. Uh, and at first I was even hesitant about writing um, about the village past uh, um, because a lot of the Italo-Canadian, uh, you know, um, literati didn't seem to be interested in that. Um, however, uh, I was encouraged um, when my first short stories that were set in Italy were well received by my non-Italian students. Uh, and when I submitted my novel to a Canadian publisher, she asked me to cut all the stories set in Italy and put them in a separate book, which then became my first book, The Girls of Piazza d'Amore. So some people um, um, have asked me if the journalist uh, represents a particular person, uh, but in reality, he does not. He's a composite of the different um, views that I remembered reading about. Um, but mainly it represents the few literati in the community that took themselves a little too seriously. Um, and especially those that came from Italy uh, that didn't really know much about our own, um, you know, voyage or our own uh, experiences. Um, and also, you know, they felt that uh, Canadian literature or Canadian writing did not, Canadian Italian writing did not conform to their idea of high culture. Uh, 
Now, the Association of Canadian and Italian Writers still exists, um, but there isn't as much importance given to literary criticism, which was the original impetus of the association. Its mission today remains that of promoting its members to, uh, by organizing readings and events, and biannual conference, which it has helped in some ways in networking with uh, Italian universities. Um, however, uh, in the community, there's still much complaining about the poor visibility of Italian Canadian writers outside of the community. And by the community, I mean the small writing community, because even the various Italian communities at large do not really support Italian Canadian writing. They do not support literature to begin with. So um, we have many community papers today and magazines that claim to speak about Italian reality, but none of them offer literary reviews. They cover sports, food festivals, but little literature. Um, so um, there are many Italian Canadian writers also that look to Italy and they would obviously, we all love to be published in Italy. But of course, the challenges there are just as big as being published and being uh, in, in, in Canada. Um, I have attended a number of book fairs in Italy. Uh, we exchange lists without publishers to sell our rights. Now, Italian, to me, and this is my own observation, it may not be so, but Italian publishers seem to be more interested in Canadian authors than Italian Canadian authors, especially if these uh, Italian Canadian authors write about immigration. Um, you know, they're quite blase about it. And yet today, immigration is such a relevant topic in Italy. Um, but um, the good news is that there are many young writers of Italian origin that may not identify themselves as Italian Canadians, but still infuse their writing with Italian references to their roots. And just as in the past, uh, in the past couple of years, Guernica Edition has published many dynamic writers of Italian origins that write in many genre styles. I can name a few, Giovanna Riccio, the book of poetry of Barbie, Ariana De Nino, who wrote a, a novel set in Africa, The Africaner, uh, that will be translated into Italian and German. Uh, Guillermo Dizzo has written a crime thriller set in Sicily and so on and so forth. We still, we don't, uh, Wernicke Edition does not now publish uh, exclusively, exclusively Italian Canadian authors. Um, we, you know, we publish Canadian authors uh, in general, um, but uh, we still publish Italian Canadian authors uh, each year. Um, so now it is also true that there are others writers of Italian origin that do not want to be classified as Italian Canadian writers, fear of being pegged. The question of classification and what to call for oneself is still not an easy one to answer. When my first book came out and my publicist tried to get me reviewed in the National Post, which is a national paper, they didn't review the book, but they asked me to write a piece on immigrant writing. They automatically classified as immigrant writing. So I did write a piece and I will read you part of that article and um, I can send you the article later. And I wrote a piece uh, uh, called Immigrant Literature and the Canadian Canon uh, and I will finish uh, with this read. Uh, classifications are useful in academia. Courses are built around specific genre and themes in literature and who would complain of being pigeonholed when one's book makes it in a class reading list. However, while useful in certain contexts, these labels become problematic when they're used to marginalize one's work or cut the author's chances of being recognized as a full participant in the Canadian literary scene. In my experience, most literary writers don't set, don't set out to write a story with a category in mind, it just happens. And as is typical of most first time novelists, my debut novel draws heavily on childhood memories, which for me meant life in a Southern Italian village in the 1950s undergoing momentous changes. Since I am of Italian origin, my work will undoubtedly be classified under Italian Canadian literature or immigrant literature. But what are the boundaries for a work to be classified as such? Many second and third generation writers of Italian origin don't write about immigration or well on cultural identity issues at all. When and where does one stop being considered an immigrant writer? Immigrant literature has been tied closely to the history of Canada. It has influenced Canadian literature from its start and given shape to the evolution of Canada's identity as a country. It was Susanna Moody's Roughing It in the Woods, an immigrant's guide for British people looking to move to Canada, 
that entrenched into the Canadian psyche the iconic image of Canada as a harsh land to be tamed, a theme further embraced and perpetuated by Canada's own Margaret Alfred. For what I remember of my literature classes, Moody's book, though rich in immigrant themes and metaphors, is not classified as immigrant text, but as a Canadian literature. It's heartening that in the last years, many Canadian writers of diverse cultural origins have become household names and recognized with some of the country's most prestigious prizes. And I name Michael Banji, uh, Nino Ricci, Kim Thue, Madeleine Tien, and so on, many, many writers of cultural, uh, cultural communities. Um, that they have contributed immensely to Canada's literature is an understatement. But there's still grumbling in the Italian Canadian writing community. Discussion of exclusion and marginalization from the mainstream literary industry are still frequent, except for a few playwrights like Micone, Rossi, Nardi, Galuccio, and a handful of male authors, Italian Canadian writers, especially women writers, have been exceptionally underrepresented and underappreciated. Writing, like all art, is central to building a culture. Good writing does so without exploding stereotypes and ultimately shines a light on the universal truth that binds us all. The culture that I belong to happens to be rooted in the Italian immigrant one. I wish to neither wave it like a flag on World Cup soccer finals, nor downplay it for fear of being classified and possibly excluded. It's who I am. Whether classified as such or simply as good literature, immigrant literature has opened Canadian readers to other cultures and helped form the vibrant, multicultural, multifaceted, cosmopolitan society that Canada is in the 21st century century, and a more than honor to be considered part of this tradition. So I end with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Connie. Of course, here on the platform, it's not possible to clap the hands. I mean, you don't. <laughs> you. So I already I already see some students that wanna, are ready to ask you some questions. But before, uh, just, just a moment. Uh, uh, Steve, are you are you on? I would like to introduce you to, with Steven Sacco. I see he's connected. Hi, Connie. Uh, oh, uh, hi, hi. I hear you. We don't see you, Steve. Um, you know, let me see if I can get the. Uh -huh. No. No. Okay, it doesn't matter. For some reason, it's not letting me on there. Mm -hmm. Connie, great to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Did you see from our, our mutual cousin that uh, we are officially cousins? Uh, I think like second second generation removed. <laughs> yeah, I have to look that up and understand how that happened, but I believe it. If you're from uh, Miglierina, or rather your you know uh, ancestors are from Miglierina, um, there has to be some kind of connection for sure. Yeah, my my cousin Elisa or my uh, great aunt Elisabetta married a Guzzo back in uh, like 1903. Of course, half of Miliarina is a Guzzo, and, <laughs> and the other half is Guzzi with an I. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Great to have you here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's uh, let's start with the question. Oh, sorry, the first. Okay, one moment. I have. Okay, Lucia, Lucia. Yes, you can ask your question. Ciao. I'm here. Yes. Nice right. to meet you. Thank you. So I'm from Angoli, near Miglierina. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you this question. The name of Lucia in your books, uh, is it because of the devotion of Miglierina for, uh, San, for, um, for Santa Lucia? Of course, uh, when I try to think of names, I try to think of names that were most popular. And one of the most popular names is Lucia because, um, you know, we have um, Santa Lucia as a patron saint. And in the book, I also mentioned the, um, the Fiera di Santa Lucia. It's in my first book. I mentioned the Fiera of the Santa Lucia. Um, so it's, um, it, that was one of the reasons I chose that name, yes. And Antonio, uh, well, there's other names that have Antonio was also a very common name. Um, and then um, that's that's Lucia's uh, boyfriend in in in, in, uh, in Miglierina was Antonio or Toto. We called him Toto because Antonio was often uh, shortened to Toto. Yeah. <laughs> What's uh, I just want to uh, give you an, an anecdote to that in that we choose names without uh, thinking uh, about the consequences. When I finished my first novel, 
uh, I sent it to, to an uncle. His name is Antonio. He lives, um, was now deceased, but he lived in Florida at the time. He emigrated. And as I sent the book, I was, I, you know, I panicked uh, because I realized that my uncle, he had a girlfriend named Lucia, and he left her to emigrate to the States. And, I, and his, his name was Antonio, and Lucia's boyfriend's name was named Antonio. And I says, my God, my uncle's going to think that I wrote about him. <laughs> it's funny when we choose names and, and how people sometimes read. And I don't know whether he thought that. I never heard anything. But uh, I was afraid that uh, he would have uh, blamed me <laughs> for telling his story. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Lucia, Daniela. Um. Here I am. I'm sorry, but my camera doesn't work today. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I do. OK, well, um, I would like to ask you a question about Italian immigration to Canada. Um, yes. As you surely know, Italian immigrants in the United States have been heavily discriminated. Um, yes. Do you think uh, um, the same happens in Canada? Uh, do you know experiences of people who are close to you? That were ex you mean close to me that were um, uh, discriminated against? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, my personal uh, experience is I came to Canada in '57. I was nine years old. I went to English school, and my personal experiences were very positive ones. Our teachers helped us a lot, helped a lot of the new immigrants. However, there was a talk that the earlier generation that came before us in the later 90s, be before the World War, were more highly, were more discriminated. Uh, um, it could be that, you know, because of their peasant origins. Um, and uh, they were especially ex the discriminated uh, in Quebec uh, because in Quebec we have French schools and English schools. And um, the French schools were Catholic, the English schools were Protestant. So naturally Italians wanted to go to the Catholic schools. And some of the French schools did not like to, to accept the immigrants because they had to waste too much time with them. So as a consequence, we all went to English schools. And that eventually in the 70s, that turned, uh, you know, that turned into a problem because the French schools, the numbers were going down, the English schools were going up, and then there was a whole fight about. And now in Quebec, you cannot attend for, uh, English school if, you, if you're a newcomer. In any case, that's another story. Um, so... There seemed to be some um, discrimination uh, from some areas, um, you know, uh, of, the, of, the, of the country. Uh, also in the 50s, I do remember, I used to lis listen to a lot of Italian radio, I mean, Italian um, local radio. And I remember once um, someone complaining that they had seen a sign on a door that says uh, in French, Maison à louer aux des Italiens. That means uh, house for rent, but no Italians. Uh, so I can't say that there was no discrimination at all, um, but it was more contained. Uh, it was more um, in the, from individual people and not, um, and, and it wasn't institutionalized. Uh, I think that um, Canada as a country, as an institution, mm -hmm. uh, did help immigrants quite a bit. Right. Yeah, so that's what I can say. Uh, I know that in, obviously in the U.S. there are other stories, but of course in the U.S. too, the immigration was different. They, came, they, they went to, to the States much earlier than we did. And, and it, was a different, it was a different type of immigration altogether, I believe, yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes, and this is also connected to the multiculturalism that you talk about. Yes, that's also another big difference. Yeah, uh, that's right. And Canada, I mean, it's a, that's a very important topic. I would, if we had more time to talk about it, I mean, it's interesting for the students. But I, I would like to the to to hear the questions before, and then sure. time we sure. can go on this topic, okay? So, Ioana. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice, to, nice to meet you, Connie. Thank you. Um, since your novels are going to be translated and uh, published in Italy, um, wh what is your Italian target reader? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, well, 
the woman deals with the stories of three women. It is considered a very feminine novel, even though it does uh, deal with many issues that are not just feminine issues. Um, so I would like, uh, you know, to have a wide, um, a wide uh, readership. Um, I think that I hope that uh, it has good readership in Calabria because it deals with, uh, it's heavily set in Calabria. Um, it brings out many of the old uh, traditions that I remember as a child with lovingly, like there is no um, resentment, you know, in that aspect, you know. I, in fact, the reason why my um, editor uh, called this uh, book, the actual, the, um, the actual, happened on cats on the cats are called cats of the more there was no such cats of the more in Mulirena, or rather Millerina, which i you know um the the actual place that i visualized was Tokiano don carlo which was my ruga la ruga la mia ruga okay my neighborhood um but the, uh, the 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 editor felt that there was so much there seemed to be so much love towards uh, you know my old uh, you know memories that she wanted to put amore on the on the, on the book. So I had to change somewhat. I had to put a scene where Piazza, you know, Piano Don Carlo became Piazza d'Amore. Okay, so as I, just to tell you that I did have a very loving vision or view towards uh, that part of my past. Um, so I do hope that Calabrian women, especially, will read it. Um, and I do hope that they read it in such a way that they also understand the process of immigration, what it does to people, and that they will also understand the new immigrants coming in. And in fact, because of that, when I put these two novels together, I tied them together, even though the book isn't published yet, and I don't know how, what kind of revision it will have, but I did uh, want to tie them by uh, Cathy's going back to Italy in the 19, in 2019. And of course, you cannot go to Italy in 2019 without listening to the discussions about immigration, the newcomers and, uh, you know, and, and Lampedusa and, and so on and so forth. So I do, I do also mention those uh, phenomena in the, in, the, in the Italian book. Hopefully that it also, you know, rings a bell and that uh, it, it, it uh, draws a chord to, you know, to the readers. Um, hopefully as many readers as possible, but, you know, it's, when you publish a book, it's thrown out there and you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Thank you for the question. It will have a huge success. <laughs> I know. Okay, thank you. And now Jessica. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Hi. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. No, I only hear you. Not yet. You talk. Oh, never mind. So uh, I just asked my, my question. Uh, so, Italian Canadian literature evokes a sense of female community, which is also based on writing about and for women. I would like to know if you um, aim for this in your artistic and everyday life. Um, in terms of what I, I don't quite understand, it, uh, what I you're talking about my own personal life? Yes, I'm asking you if this sense of female community ah. of female community, which is also um, yes common in your writing, yes, is um, like something it, that you aim for. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, there is a sense of community within, uh, uh, you know, within the, the women of our community, um, especially the, you know, those of us that have the same um, experiences as immigrants. Um, and, uh, and it's that sense, obviously, that I also wanted to bring uh, to the book. Um, I mean, you know, in terms of as a writer, um, Sometimes it's harder to be taken seriously because you're you're a woman Italian Canadian writer, um, which may not have anything to do with your question, but it, you know, it does has to do with being a woman. Um, sometimes they prejudge us. They figure, oh well, she just wrote about her immigrant experience. It can be much good, uh, without realizing that 
you know, there's different types of immigrant uh, experience stories and that not every story is the same. And, and this is what I also try to say in, in my, you know, interactions with the journalists, you know. Um, but uh, personally, I, I have a sense of community with many of my girlfriends and uh, I have many Italian girlfriends uh, because when I attended school, English schools were almost crowded with Italian newcomers because many of us came in the 50s and we all went to English schools. So the English school, were, they were actually, in some cases, it was 80% Italian. So most of my school friends uh, are still, you know, Italian. Uh, they came from different parts, Campo Basso mainly, many from Molise, um, from Udine, um, you know, from uh, Northern Italy also, um, Sicily, a lot of Sicilians, uh, many Calabrese from Basilicat, all over. And, you know, um, we naturally, at first, we we were close together because we had, you know, uh, a lot in common. Uh, and I'm still friends. I mean, my, I still have a lot of Italian friends. Uh, even, I, I mean, I married a non-Italian. My husband was of Irish descent. But he became Italian because, uh, you know, he liked our food, uh, he liked my friends, uh, so he became more Italian than, than I was. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, Marielle. Yes, I'm yeah. here. Eventually, yeah. you see me in a minute. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you for being here and to, for talking with us. It is a precious moment for us as students and as people. So um, my question is a little bit more of a technical one because um, you have put your own experience and emotions in your books. And as a clear course final exam, uh, each of us is going to write an essay about migration and some of them will also be featured in a book called Calabrian Voices with Professor Steven Sacco. Oh, so great. this is doubly important for us and of course it is also a first experience for us because we will have to write in English it is an exam so I wanted to ask you um, creative writing may or may not be implied in this too so can you give us some advice on how to portray such emotional stories because many of our essays will be on our families or yes. friends migration experiences so it is it is a good challenge yeah well um i think that um, my novel because it has a lot of autobiographical content could even be considered a memoir novel you know even though a lot of it is fictionalized, I, I chose to fictionalize it. Uh, the story of, Ali, of, of Lucia's beating uh, and her proxy marriage, um, that's all fiction. Okay? Um, now, uh, when you take a, a true story, or even you know, when, when you're writing a biography or you know, the story of, uh, of a person you know, um, I think you want to do it creatively. Okay? Uh, the best way to do it is to, you know, um, to use uh, the devices used in uh, fiction to write it. So it's in the it's, it's in the devices that you use, in the structure that you give your story. Um, also, it's in the details that you choose to select. Okay, uh, there are some details that you bring out more than others because they have symbolic meaning. Um, so you may be telling a true story, but you use fictional devices to tell it uh, so then it becomes creative non-fiction okay so uh, it's not it's not fiction uh, it's you know uh, it's you're telling the truth uh, but you can um, embellish it without changing the truth as long as you maintain uh, the basic truth of what you're trying to say okay you can still make changes to it by using creative devices to make it a lot more interesting and interesting for the reader uh, and, and as I said more creative and uh, you know look up creative nonfiction, and um, you know you will see that uh, there are many ways that you can um, uh, make your writing stand out even you know if it's just a very common story because you have to find the uncommon in the common obviously. yes thank you the point was uh, we want to make our stories all stand out, possibly. Yeah. So, thank you was a good answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank so much. you. 
Okay, adesso Maria Rosa, it's your turn. Okay, I'm here. Just one minute. Maybe you can see me now. Okay, and um, my question is, uh, so we know that you graduated from uh, Creative Writing Master's program at Concordia University. So I was wondering if, uh, has the writing always played a central role in your life? Uh, I have to say that writing itself did not, I'm not one of those people that wrote since I was a child, like, a, like my narrator, Katerina, I did not, even though I loved reading. I was a very good student, I loved reading. I attended school in Italy, I attended um, the beginning of fourth grade. So I still remember poetry, that we, you know, the poetry of the time that, uh, um, that we recited. Um, I even remember memorizing parts of the, of the book Cuore by Mondo mm -hmm. Amicis. Um, <laughs> and once I remember that the teacher brought me, you know, brought me to different classes to have me recite, you know, parts of it by heart because she was, uh, you know, uh, she was happy that I had uh, been able to, to, uh, to memorize it. Um, so I loved reading, I loved literature. And I have to confess that I left school early. Uh, my own personal experience mm -hmm. is such that I had to leave the school early because of, you know, personal family situation. And I, I left school and I worked, uh, I worked as a hairstylist for many years. Okay. Uh, but then I decided to go back, but I, you know, I went back, I studied literature. I studied literature uh, at Concordia during the uh, Concordian Loyola College at the time. Um, I studied Italian literature. Um, so I wrote, uh, you know, academic papers, uh, you know, then I started a business, I wrote the business letters and so on, but I never wrote creatively as such until in 2000, I decided to go back and study literature. Then I took a creative writing course that was given in a community college called Writing for Fun. It was just a non-credit course. I took it for fun, for fun, as, as the title of the course said. And I found out that um, writing was not as difficult as I thought it would be. So I came to writing really late. When I say late, I mean in my 50s, okay? Uh, whatever I wrote seemed to be well received. People liked what I wrote. So that encouraged me. And, that, and then because of that, I decided then to go back to Concordia and rather than study literature, to study creative writing. And that's how, how I got to writing. Um, so it's something that uh, blossomed really much, much later in my life. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Giada. I'm here. Um, in our course, we studied uh, Penny Petrone, and we know she's a pioneer figure in the field of Italian Canadian literature. And we talked about her feeling of shame for her origins uh, because her family spoke a different language and they had different traditions. So I wanted to ask you how do you leave your identity and if you had a similar experience when you moved to Montreal? So if you were ashamed at the beginning of your origins or not? Yeah. Um, I think there was a big difference um, with, the, you know, as I said, there's different uh, types of immigration. Those that immigrated much earlier had more of a sense of sometimes shame. Um, also because, um, you know, as children, myself too, even at the time that I immigrated, we lived in two different worlds. We lived in a world at home, which was still, you know, our tradition, especially myself, Calabrese traditions were upheld. Then we would go to school in an English school and, you know, have another life there. But those the, of us that came after the, uh, the war in the 50s, either because, like myself, I had studied a bit in, in, in Italy. As I said, I read Italian literature. I had read poems. I came with a sense of worth, I think, much more maybe than those that came or that, you know, they came as children and that didn't know anything about Italian culture. Uh, so in, there was a difference there. Um, so those of us that came into the 50s, I, ha I think, had a less, a, at least those of us that came here to Canada. I can't speak for those that went to the States. Um, those that came to Canada, um, as I said, there was a little bit of discrimination at the beginning, but not that much. Um, and then soon, uh, you know, our, um, you know, everybody loved our food. Um, uh, you know, now being Italian isn't considered uh, being, you know, 
inferior to anybody. It's considered, you know, our children, for example, my sons who are half Italian, half English, they like to say that they, they have an Italian mother. They're not ashamed of it, you know. Um, and so is with that with that wave. I think we came um, after the war, uh, were a little more educated maybe, um, and we didn't feel. I mean, there were definitely a lot of conflict with, with, with parents. Conflict, generational conflicts were there because our parents were very strict. They were very protective. Uh, for example, when I went, when I attended high school, I wasn't allowed to go to the evening dances and their evening dances on a Saturday, you know, that was a big thing, but I wasn't allowed to go. So obviously, you know, I didn't like that, but it didn't make me hate my Italianity. It wasn't, I didn't blame it at that. I blamed that my parents were said, you know, how come, you know, you come here and you bring the village with you. And they were always afraid that what is the neighbor going to say? What is the neighbor going to think? And it was that kind of mentality that I didn't like, which belonged to my parents and to that also very, let's have to say, very Calabrian way of thinking in the 50s, okay? Don't forget, it was in the 50s. Uh, um, so it was that rather than the culture. In fact, when I went to high school, I didn't change my name to Connie. My name was always Conchetta, and my, that's that's my, my birth name. So my high school friends still call me Conchetta because that's how they know me, how they knew me in school. So it didn't bother me that they called me Conchetta. Uh, it changed when I started working, and uh, Canadians couldn't pronounce Conchetta. I was saying Conchita, Concita. Once co somebody called me Concerto, and that's said, well, <laughs> Concerto doesn't sound too good. <laughs> so the owner of the, because at the time, at the beginning, I was working in a beauty salon, because I worked as a beautician at the time, as a hairstylist. Um, so the owner changed my name to Connie to make it easier for the, and then that name stuck. Uh, but then I do, even in, in, the, in the book, I do write about that. And I say, you know, what name should I give my, my novel? Should it be, uh, should it be um, Katerina or Kathy, Angelina or Angie? Is selling one's name, is using, you know, is changing one's name as selling out of one's identity? I do make that reflection, okay, in the book. Um, but personally, it just happened that my name got changed to Connie. It wasn't um, because I wanted to, to show that I was Italian. Uh, and today, I have to say that here in Quebec, uh, Italians are very well seen. And now, you know what they're saying? They say, well, all immigrants should be like you <laughs> because, they, you know, we have really contributed much to, to the country. We have contributed to the province, to the city, and we're very well seen by everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And now, Annalisa. Okay, I'm here. I don't know if you see me. Yeah, just, yeah. Nice to meet you, yeah. Mr. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask you something about the process of writing. Uh, so, um, can we consider the need of writing uh, as an attempt to crystallize the um, memories that belong to the past, uh, or as an attempt to build, uh, metaphorically, a kind of bridge between Italy and Canada? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there is. Is that a, is that the question? What is the question? Is whether I wanted to bring uh, to build a bridge? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That that was the whole point, uh, uh, and what uh, Kathy, you know, struggled with, and the reason why she claimed she wanted to do it was because um, Lucia got beaten by her, and uh, it was first it was thought that it was her husband, and it was the husband that she married by proxy. Um, and it's not that she did not love husband. It's not not love this man. Um, so she wanted to understand. Uh, you know, she says. You know, she hadn't since they had arrived. She hadn't seen Lucia for many years. And then this happened, uh, and she asked herself, uh, did this happen because of what had happened in the village of the stories? Of the village. The reason why she had to leave a boyfriend. And so she, uh, in in her way, she wanted to understand the present, uh, because in reality the past does impinge on the present, on our present lives. So we cannot leave it completely behind. Um, and in fact, I even try to make that even clearer in the book, uh, because at the end of the book, after, you know, which is after, at the end of the second book, which is set in Montreal, one of the last stories is a story that goes back, all the way back to the village stories. And the reason why I put that in there is that, you know, it's Jira Nejira, you know, we, we come from a place, 
that place and what has happened to us does have an impact on our lives. Um, and uh, and then, you know, trying to understand it is the reason why I wanted to write about it. Does it be, build bridges? Um, yes, even if it's only in our minds, in our imagination, it does uh, build bridges. And it's important as, as you know, one of the maxim, it's uh, you can't, you know, you can't think of the future without you know, thinking about where you come from. So you have to know where you come from before you go on in the future. Yeah, thank you so thank you. much. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Now, Jessica. Jessica? Yes, yes. I'm here. Yes. Yes, so um, I would like you to ask, I would like you, mm, I would like to ask you something about your novel. Um, because you have written about the, dif the difficult relationship between Lucia and her author Angie. I want to ask you if there is something personal in this and maybe if you had a different relationship with your mother as a child and you uh, probably transferred this in mm -hmm. the novel. Um, no, my, I had a good relationship with my mother, even though as a teenager, uh, obviously I sometimes didn't like what she, you know, wanted me to do or not do, especially what not to do. Um, but I understood that as being, you know, part of who she was. She was conditioned that way as a child, so she could change. Okay. But the, um, the character of Angie as a troubled teenager came to me uh, because the one thing that uh, I don't know if it's in my bio or not, but um, for many years, uh, I, I used to teach in a high school, very similar to the school that I pictured in the book. Uh, but the high school was what, was what we call a comprehensive high school. I don't know if they didn't, I don't think they do exist uh, in Italy. And they, in, in that high school, there was the academic profile, the commercial, and then there was also a vocational profile. In other words, students could learn uh, professions like hairdressing electricity and so forth. Because I had experience in hairstyling, hair I taught a, hairdress, a professional hairdressing course and I taught there for 20 years. And in, in the school and in the book also, the narrator Kathy is a teacher teaching that subject. And um, in my class, because it wasn't an academic subject, they used to place a lot of special ed students, what we call special ed students, students that had uh, problems uh, with learning, learning disabilities, and so on. So I had a lot of troubled teenagers in my classes. Um, either they weren't necessarily um, academically, um, sometimes they were just emotionally troubled, you know. Uh, and I had one particular Italian girl, a Sicilian girl in my class, who was quite intelligent, um, but she had been, you know, very held down by her parents. Um, she came into my class. Um, she couldn't see, she couldn't read. I mean, this was secondary five, like 10, 11 years of school, and she couldn't read. And I says, how come you can't read? And she says, well, I can't read because I can't see. She couldn't see, she needed glasses. So she had never learned how to read. And I says, why don't you get glasses? She says, well, my father is a silly and he doesn't want me to get glasses because I uh, would get married. That actually happened in my class, <laughs> okay? Um, so, and there were other cases like that of uh, very, you know, troubled teenagers uh, that had problems with their parents. So I model, when I thought of Angie, I, th I thought of one of those girls in my classes more than uh, myself. Okay, because yeah. I was thinking about this uh, common gap that do exist between the different generations and between mothers and daughters in uh, Italian Canadian novels. So I yeah. thought it was like something like this. Well, I mean, I used, uh, as I said, I used, um, you know, a composite uh, of, of my students for her image. However, she did represent that. She did represent the, the problem between the generations um, because her mother, uh, the, what happens to Lucia is that she, she's the, the second um, book starts with her being in a coma and we never hear anything from her. Okay. And then we learn that she has almost lived as if in a coma. From the time that she emigrated, the time that this happened, she lived as in a coma. She wasn't that into her 
daughter's education. So her, her daughter was quite, um, uh, had been um, quite ignored. Um, she had married, um, she had married an older man. So the, the student, the Angie did not relate to her, to her father who was much older. Um, he was very traditional. So definitely there was that a problem within her family that had kept her behind. They had kept her behind in school, but she was very smart. She was a smart girl, um, but she could read. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I did uh, model her after my Sicilian student that could read because she she didn't have any glasses. Um, and uh, Kathy tries to help her, but and tried to help her. She also, you know, caused problems in her own personal life and so on. Um, but uh, generational, especially not so much, obviously now not, we, we don't have those problems anymore with the second and third generation. Um, but uh, that first generation, there were problems, definitely. And, and one of the biggest problem I have to say, and, and really emphasize this, is that especially children that were born here, they often uh, went to English school, of course, they learned English, their parents didn't learn English, their parents couldn't speak English, so often there was very little communication between the children and the parents because of this lack of communication in languages. Um, the parents couldn't help the children in school because they were, you know, they were studying in English. Um, so there was a lot of problems, uh, generational problems because of that. There was a lot, lack of communication um, for, because of language, um, because of values and traditions. Um, so it, we, you know, we, we heard a lot of these situations uh, at the time of, the, of that immigration, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Bene, allora, adesso Lucia. I don't know if you can see me. I have bad yeah. connection. Yes. <laughs> so, my question is, how much your Italianity did um, influence your life in Canada as a way of thinking and traditions and so on? Oh, uh, it had a great influence, of course. Uh, well, traditions, um, you know, our parents try to maintain all the traditions. I mean, uh, sometimes that caused problems because, you know, as I said, you know, we attended the English schools uh, and we couldn't do some of the things that our friends were doing. Um, however, you know, I did maintain my traditions. We attended um, an Italian parish church. So I attended, um, you know, we went to church regularly. And the church was also sort of a social center almost. So we had activities there. I remember, you know, with my friends, also other Italian friends, um, we put on plays um, in Italian. Um, and um, there was also another other activities. I remember there was an activity called Sodalizio, Giacomo Leopardi, in which we studied um, Leopardi's uh, poetry. Um, and again, you know, that was an activity that was tied to my education in, in my, you know, Italian culture. And I never tried to hide that. Um, um, and other traditions, um, you know, family traditions uh, were always respected. Um, so, um, and then in my book, in terms of my book, how and I, the reason why I also include Manzoni in there in the book, uh, I think, is the fact that I also wanted to point out that she also had that tradition of that type of a novel in her mind. And because of that, that's the kind of novel she also wanted to write, right? She wanted to write a novel that had a happy ending where everybody was happy at the end um, because she was, as I said, she had cultivated that vision. Um, and she, you know, she compared Lucia's action with the other Lucia and so forth. Um, and it was the traditional view against the, you know, more modern, postmodern view that is also at play here, and that she also tries to have to include in the book. Um, that's that's as much as I can <laughs> can answer. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So this was the last question, and uh, we only have 10 minutes left. I would okay. like to uh, to call in, let's say, Carla Tempestoso. Uh, probably not, Connie, I think you and Carla met at okay. the unicorn, right? Okay. Carla. Yeah, I'm here. Hello, hello, Connie. Hi. 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 Oh, there Hi. you are. Hello, Hi. everybody. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Glad to see you again. Hi. 
Yes, I want to thank you, Connie, and of course, um, Professor Ganeri for this interesting and uh, uh, always, uh, always um, uh, really motivating uh, um, topic about uh, not only um, migration studies, but also about uh, the important field of Italian Canadian studies. And um, I want to, I, I want actually ask to um, uh, Connie if um, it is important during the writing uh, process to even to think about your in-between identities. I mean, uh, when you write hmm, uh, in, in your personal uh, um, uh, process, uh, writing process, uh, your also your uh, um, thinking process is uh, in between. Mm. <laughs> yes, everything we do is in between. Yes. In between. <laughs> um, and, yeah. And what but, is the question? And the question, my question actually is. How um, in Italy we are uh, extreme uh, even during the courses our courses l courses of English literature yeah. and uh, uh, also Italian literature in Italian American literature uh, we see that our students are extremely interested in to the quest the topics and and the question of uh, um as you said before insecurity about identity yes but yeah and that that's um that's impressed uh, me and i i want to say to you um, uh, could you explain uh why we should consider um, we should talk uh, about identity as insecurity today. Well, it's, it, it's insecurity, as I said, when you're living in a, you know, in, in the situation of an immigrant um, child that, um, you know, um, has been raised a certain way and then is thrown almost, you know, automatically into a different culture. Um, and, uh, you know, either... I mean, there's different ways of living that experience, and I try to sh show it with the three women. One way is to simply, you know, uh, do not even accept a new reality, or rather, is it shut yourself up, you know, in your room, always live, you know, with the uh, blinders on and the way you've always lived, okay? Um, or rebel against the old world, the way Angie mm -hmm. did. But being in between, a bit to me, I mean, is 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 the most you know, enriching way to live because first of all, you understand both worlds and you can even take the best of both worlds. The idea is that you reject that you consider, you know, that you want to reject because it doesn't work for you anymore in the new world. Uh, and you accept, you know, what's given you in the new one. Um, so it can be seen, uh, you know, that can be seen as, you know, as a glass half empty and a glass half full, depending on when you, when you see it. I see the advantages of it. I don't see it as being a yeah. thing. However, right. the, you know, there are, yeah, there are insecurities, definitely, because sometimes, you know, you're, in, you're confronted in a situation uh, where you, you know, you have to think, you know, one way, whereas you know that, you know, you, you're thinking another way, like, you are confronted with some difficult situation at times because of that. But uh, to, to me, it's enriching much more. Yeah, than this, uh, yeah because I, I think yes. actually, I think that it is synonymous with um, richness. Yes, from it a does. cultural yeah. and a literary point of view. Maybe, maybe today, nowadays, from a political point of view, could um, and it depends, of course, on the um, uh, on the several kinds of migrations. Of yes, course. Um, it is uh, uh, maybe it's insecurity from a political point of view. But yes. uh, during our studies, uh, of course, uh, we used to see um, um, in between identities as uh, definitely as richness. 
Yes, yes. And in terms of immigration, I mean, uh, this is what multiculturalists try to do, was to say that we are, in, you know, kind of saying we are enriched by newcomers. Mm -hmm. yes. We are not, you know, made any poorer for it. And in reality, I mean, Canada today is a different country than it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago because yeah. of these different cultures that have, uh, you know, enriched the country. Um, so, um, Again, it's it's it depending on the worldview that one has. Um, but that is yeah. my view. It depends. Um, it, de it depends. Yeah. Yes, but it's not an easy question, obviously. Too, I mean, um, you know, uh, immigration does cause a lot of disruptions, both for the people that come and the people that are in the country. Um, but we can also see it as a an enrichment for sure. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you, Carla, for coming. And Connie, you you haven't mentioned, or a little bit, you mentioned only when you talked about your novels and the readers in Calabria, about the Calabrese identity. Yes. And the fact whether it exists or not a Calabrese Canadian identity. And I know this is a topic that's very dear to Professor Sacco there <laughs> because he always says that he is Calabrese Americano, not Italian American, <laughs> right? So yeah. Steve, to, just to conclude, we have only four minutes, four to five minutes. So if Steve will, would like to say something about this, and then Connie can tell us what she thinks about the Calabrese identity in Canada. Yeah, Connie, that's the, you know, for us in our neighborhood on the west side of Chicago, uh, the way that we would identify ourselves, because it was an Italian neighborhood, if we asked a new kid in the, uh, if they were Italian, <laughs> then we knew that they were part of the in-group. But then the next question would be, what are you? Are yeah. you Brez? Are you Sicilian? Are you, um, or, or whatever. And then it would break down to an even smaller um, in-group of Calabrian Americans. So that's why, you know, I entitled my memoir Growing Up Calabrese versus Growing Up Italian American. Okay, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Uh, in a certain uh, sense, uh, it's the same here, even though uh, maybe less so, uh, but we do definitely, I mean, it is the first question we ask when we meet somebody that is of Italian origin, the first question we ask is where were your parents from? Which region are you from? We always ask that question. And because of that, you know, we make some assumptions also. Uh, here in Montreal, as I said, uh, the largest number, we are, we're about 200,000 uh, Italians, maybe more now. Um, the largest number is from Molise. Uh, then there's Sic Sicilians, uh, Calabrese, Napolitans, uh, Veneti. Um, and all, all, of these, all of these groups have associations now. They have regional associations. And the old generation are really attached to these associations. Uh, every year they have feasts, uh, you know, they have church holidays, uh, but they also have, um, you know, picnics and so forth. Uh, and it has, in some cases, uh, in some, you know, it has kept uh, the old generation attached, you know, to the roots in that way. Now, the sad thing is that this, once the older generation dies, the new generation is not interested in these regional associations as much anymore. Um, but that's how we have, here in Montreal, the way we have maintained our identity as uh, Calabresi is that there is a Calabresi association. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, uh, they have conferences, um, you know, they, they promote uh, Canadian uh, writers uh, and so on. Forth, you know, there was a book uh, that you know of, uh, Vito Teti um, uh, edited, of uh, uh, an anthology of Calabrese authors. Um, a philo, a philo, a philo, a philo, a philo, uh, which is all made up of, uh, which is uh, an anthology of Calabrese writers. So we have a way found a house there in that book. Um, in my own, uh, in my own um, writing, uh, in my book, I have a lot of Calabrese expressions. So there are many expressions that we cannot translate in Italian. How, how do you translate, uh, you know, culariele uh, that we used to eat, uh, you know. Uh, and so I write culariele. Um, I write all kinds of uh, dialects, uh, 
uh, expressions in my books. Um, some writers don't like that, don't, don't like writing Italian expressions in their books. They think that it's sort of a distraction. Um, but I feel that it's important uh, because there are some expressions uh, in Calabrese that you cannot say in any other language. And, and so in, in that sense, uh, you know, I have maintained that uh, identity in, in writing. In, uh, our, in our volume, Calabrian Voices, we've encouraged our CLIA students to add Italian or Calabrese words uh, instead of translating them into That's English right. in order to maintain their identity. That's right. I think that is important. And, um, you know, you can always... Uh, when that you don't have to write the translation next to it, but then you know within the next uh, two or three sentences you may write something in English to make the you know <coughs> the reader understand what that was you know. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, there's many different ways of doing it, but I think it is important to maintain that originality of of, of expressions for sure. Yeah. Right. Okay, so thank you very much. Our time is over. And uh, thank you very much, Connie, for thank being you. with us. And uh, it's been really wonderful. And thank you to all of you, to Steve Sacco, to Carla Tempesos, and of course, to all the students and also the Dr. Andy who are connected. Okay, so ciao, Connie. So, and I have to congratulate the students for speaking English so well. <laughs> Yes, are you happy about what she says? Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. Very much. I'm, I'm very impressed. Thank you. I'm very impressed. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Grazie, Connie. A presto. Arrivederci. Grazie. Arrivederci. Bye. Arrivederci. Grazie. Grazie. Bye. 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 Bye